My name is Stephen Bax and I'm going to talk to you today about the Voynich Manuscript which is a fascinating 15th century manuscript. You can see some pictures of it here on the screen. On the left hand side some interesting uh, ladies bathing in a strange green liquid and you'll see the script of the manuscript as well. On the right hand side the picture of a plant and again the fascinating script, not a single letter of which we understand, not a single word of it we can interpret as, as yet. Um, you can see more information about me on the website at the bottom of your screen and particularly if you want to read in detail what I'm going to talk about then there's a full academic article there, uh, 50 pages long, if you want to explore it in a bit more depth. This video only goes through it rather superficially to give you a general idea of the kind of direction that I'm trying to propose. Uh, here are some more examples from the manuscript. It's uh, got hundreds of pages, lots of beautiful pictures including some rather European looking castles on the left hand side there and the curious pictures of nymphs thought to be something biological but again we don't really understand what that's all about. And the manuscript itself is in Yale University Library in the United States. Um, and it's been called the most mysterious manuscript in the world because despite having hundreds of pages of script and wonderful diagrams and pictures we understand not a single word of it we don't know where it was written, we don't know who wrote it, we know nothing about it except that it was discovered in Italy as I'll say in a minute. Um, we've got some other um, pictures here, we've got what some people used to think was a picture of a sunflower uh, but after the carbon dating of the, the vellum of the manuscript to the 15th century, uh, people realised it couldn't be a sunflower because that only came to Europe much later. On the right hand side as well you've got some nice uh, pictures there of a plant and also some examples of the script which we'll talk about in most detail. Just a bit of background to explain where I come from. I'm Professor of Applied Linguistics at Crella at the University of Bedfordshire in Britain. I mainly research into reading and discourse and I've studied a number of languages which help me to understand a little bit more about the Voynich manuscript, uh, particularly Arabic, Spanish, some Hebrew and a bit of Akkadian which is the ancient language of Iraq. And you can see more about that at the website at the bottom of the page. Uh, some useful sources about the manuscript, you've got the Yale Library website, you've got Jason Davies' wonderful site where you can explore every single page of the manuscript in detail, uh, Rennie Zandbergen's excellent site mostly about the history and the background but all the information that you need about how people have tried to decipher the manuscript over the years. Um, Nick Pelling does a, an interesting blog with a nice wry style um, looking particularly at people's interpretations about the manuscript and other cipher mysteries. And last but not least you have Edith Sherwood's site where she particularly looks closely at the plants of the manuscript which is of particular value to us today of course. A uh, bit more background, the manuscript's been carbon dated to the 15th century, uh, some 240 pages of writing and illustrations and it was rediscovered about a hundred years ago in Italy by the bookseller Voynich which is why we we give it the name the Voynich manuscript. But once again not a single word of this manuscript has yet been deciphered or understood or decoded. And here you've got the quotation from Ties and Ties which expresses that as well, basically saying uh, despite all these years and the efforts of very many people we still don't understand a single word of it. Well I propose today to put that right to some extent. Um, I'm proposing today a provisional partial decoding of the manuscript. When I say partial I mean very limited. Uh, I'm proposing a decoding of roughly 14 of the characters of the script and round about 10 words. Um, proper names as we'll see in the manuscript itself. And if you want full details you're very welcome to look at the website at the bottom of the page uh, stephenbacks.net. Okay let's think about how could we possibly decode this manuscript. Now, if you look at Simon Singh's fascinating book called The Code Book he talks in particular about, um, well about codes in general, but uh, he talks about Champollion and Young who were the two people who basically worked towards the decoding and the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphics. And also Michael Ventris who in the 1950s decoded and deciphered Linear B, the script from Crete, and worked out that it was basically a very old form of Greek. And the question is how did they do it? Because I, basically I want to follow more or less their approach. 
Um, if you look at, this is Champollion here on the right hand side, basically he and also Young uh, looked for the names of pharaohs and for example they had the Rosetta Stone which is in the British Museum of course which helped them considerably but they tried to identify names of pharaohs and then um, Michael Ventress with Linear B was working on the names of towns in Crete and essentially they started with proper names they matched them with words that they could find um, in the manuscript so for example if they had the pharaoh Ramesses they would look for the word Ramesses in the manuscript in the text uh, or the name of the town Konossos, they would look for that in the text and so on. And gradually they built up a scheme of sound to symbol relationships. So they would work out, for example, that this particular sign was Ko, the next one was No, the next one was So, and so on. And this way they gradually built up a sense of what the language was in terms of the sound to symbol relationships. Uh, and with that they finally managed each of them to identify the language uh, in the first case it was the language of ancient Egyptian which was uh, related to Coptic in the second case with Michael Ventris it was obviously Greek uh, and that was the way that they did it starting with proper names matching them with words in the text and then building up a scheme of sound to sound sound to sign uh, relationships now names of plants I'm proposing that we do a similar thing uh, with the Voynich manuscript but this time we look for the names of plants and in one case a constellation, but mainly plants, to try and do the same thing as young Champollion and Ventris did. Uh, some people think that we should adopt a big theory approach. In other words, we should identify, for example, where the manuscript came from. Let's say that we think it might come from Turkey, or some people rather wackily think it comes from Mexico, whatever it may be. And they think we can, from that we can argue and try and find out something about the manuscript. But in my view, it's best to try a small-scale approach, which is what I'm suggesting here, uh, what you could call a bottom-up approach, working, for example, on, on little letters of the text, trying to work on proper names, and then building up gradually to try and understand more about the manuscript as a whole. So I propose to examine five plants in the manuscript and one constellation, the constellation of Taurus, trying to identify the probable proper names of these plants and then gradually working out the sounds of each Voynich sign, sign by sign. Now, if I'm successful or not, well, that's really for you to judge, and I'll put it out today for you to think about. But once again, if you want to read the full document, please go to stephenbax.net. You can find it there. Now, let's start with uh, this page of the manuscript. Uh, when I was looking at the manuscript over some two years ago, um, I noticed this rather interesting pattern here, which you can see in the top right, which looks like an O, and then a character which is transcribed in some of the transcriptions as a, an R, and then another O and an R. And it's quite unusual to get a repeating pattern like this in the, in the manuscript. So I thought to myself, maybe that's a word. It could actually be a word. Um, it's transcribed as Oror, but I thought it might actually resemble the word Arar, which is the Arabic word for juniper and also the Hebrew word or related to the Hebrew word for juniper. So I noticed that on this page here, and you'll see this is a double page spread of the manuscript, um, it's described as F16V and F16R. F just means folio or page. So these are two pages uh, quite early on in the manuscript and you'll see that on this page here the first word includes the oror pattern but it has another letter in front of it. On this page here, the last paragraph also includes oror, but has another character in front of it. And I thought to myself also, this word here could be oror, but with a slightly different ending, which I'll come to in a minute. But it then occurred to me that this plant here, in this picture, might well be a type of juniper, in fact what's called juniperus oxycedrus, um, and I thought that might be uh, the name of the plant in the text linking with the picture. So I, I produced a, a short article about this two years ago and sent it round to a number of people to look at. You can see here Juniperus oxycedrus, uh, the Voynich plant on the left hand side, and then on the right hand side you've got an example of this um, species of juniper, uh, very spiky with the red berries of course and again notice the very sharp spikes here which I thought rather resembled the sharp spikes here. Some people have identified this as the cannabis plant but for me the, the spiky leaves are far more like this one, the juniper plant. 
So it seemed to me that this or or uh, shape might be in fact representing the Arabic ar ar or something similar to that. And here's the Arabic word ar ar, read from right to left of course. Uh, the juniper historically was used to create oil of cade which was um, obviously useful for skin problems and for this reason it struck me that quite possibly um, this could be an interpretation of these uh, letters. And I sent the article around to various people and some people rightly criticised this and said well it's fine looking for the word ar ar in this word here but here you don't have that word, you have something else at the beginning and here you do as well. These may be completely different words and here furthermore it's actually a completely different letter. So although your theory seems possible, uh, it's still a little bit doubtful and we couldn't possibly agree with it in full at this stage. And I must say I agree with that. I think it's a very tempting theory but without further evidence it couldn't really be uh, taken as plausible. So let's actually see some of the further evidence. Now, um, I said to you before that not a single word has been interpreted in the whole manuscript, but actually there's one word which people have identified and tried to identify uh, and interpret. And this is the word Taurus. And if you look on the left-hand side, you have this wonderful uh, picture with the moon in the middle and lots of beautiful stars around, all with names you'll see, none of which we understand as yet. But here you've got a curious, like a looped, line here going to seven stars. You can see that more clearly here on the right hand side. And it was thought that these seven stars might mean the seven sisters, the Pleiades, which are in the constellation of Taurus, and that this possibly actually means Taurus. Some people have suggested that. Now, I think that's possibly true, because if you take the letters that I've already identified with Arar, in other words the second one here, and that one there, you have a, an A and a Ra, and that seems to fit with Taurus more or less. So if you look at the um, diagram at the bottom, let's assume that this one is a Ta, this one is an A of some sort, this one Ta, wo, ta ha, could be an O or, or an A sound, let's call it A for the moment. The third one we know already might be a Ra. The fourth one I'll, I'll suggest later is a N sound for reasons I'll explain. But let's assume then that this is actually saying Taurus, or in this case Taurun, and that this means we've got not only the two letters that we saw before, but two more, and I'll argue another one as well. So again, on its own this is insubstantial. No one's yet really been able to prove or show that this is Taurus, but I think that the evidence is starting to build up, and I'll try and explain why I think this is in fact Taurus, and this letter, the first letter, is a T sound, the second is an A sound, and so on through the letters. So, let's move on then to the third possibility. And here we have what I think might be the plant coriander. This has been identified as the coriander plant by Sherwood and others, and it seems quite distinctively like coriander, you can see that there. Although, of course, like all the Voynich plants, there are some rather odd elements of it which nobody quite understands, but that could just mean it's a, a foreign or unusual version of the plant. But anyway, taking other people's idea that this might be coriander, I noticed that there's a strange addition to the text. You've got the normal text here on the bottom, but you've got something added just above the first word. And you can see that more clearly over here. Now it struck me that this might be typical of um, medieval herbal manuscripts. It might actually be the name of the plant, but a different name from the normal name that the writers know. So the writer's basically saying, uh, this plant is called whatever we normally call it, but this is what other people have called it, so they write in a marginal gloss there. So I, I assume that this might actually mean coriander, or some version of the word coriander. So applying what we already know about the letters, uh, we've already got from Taurus and from uh, the Arar, we've already got the Ta, we've got the Ra, and we've got here an A and an A. So already we've got rat a uh, in the middle. Now if we extrapolate from that, we could assume that this might be a k. This might be something like an o uh, or u. So we've got kurata. Now this does actually resemble, if you look at some old versions of the, the word coriander, and there are hundreds of different ways of writing coriander, uh, cilantro, kilantro, uh, Danya in Hindi and so on, so many different ways. But if you just take uh, some of the, the oldest ones of all, you've got Greek linear B, Koriyadana, you've got the da there instead of the ta. 
Um, you've got English coriander, coriander. You've got the N in there, but you don't have it in the old Greek form. Uh, kilanthro, you can spell it, of course, in a different way, but kilanthro still has a, a ka, a la instead of a ra, and then it's got here a na, and then a ta instead of a da. Now, working through other languages, I suggest that this possibly is an interpretation of this particular word. You've got ka, u, because that it's a double letter there, o, o, I'm assuming is u, ra, we've seen before, a, kura, ta, a, like a schwa or an u sound, and then an unknown one at the end. But kurata fits the letters that we've already suspected quite well, and also adds the possibility that this is a ka sound here. So this is the interpretation of coriander. Once again, as with the previous ones, on its own we can't believe it. But as we go through we'll see how the evidence is building up for this sequence of letters being possibly true. Let's look then at the fourth um, plant that we're going to look at. And this is the plant which is called um, Kentauria. Uh, that's the name of the genus. There are several species within that, hundreds of species actually within that. And if we look at um, folio 2 uh, R in the Voynich manuscript, you'll come across this picture. And this has been identified again by Sherwood and others as uh, the Kentauria, various different species of the genus Kentauria, but nonetheless it's clearly a Kentauria, and I think there is very little argument about that. Um, some uh, versions of this are the, the knapweed and the cornflower, but this is obviously not a, a Western European version, uh, but it could be from Eastern Europe or from Asia. And now, if you look at the first word again, and again it's important to start with the first word because in medieval herbal manuscripts that was typically whether the herb was actually named. Not always, but typically it was named there, or at least in the first line. So here if we look at the first word, and also the first words of the second paragraph, you've got two paragraphs here. This is the first paragraph, enlarged, and you've got the word here. And you'll notice that the first letter is the same as the letter that we just saw with coriander, the ka. So I was beginning to suspect that this actually might be the word kentauria in one form or another. So let's look at the evidence for that. Now, kentauria was a very well-known plant in uh, the ancient times and in the Middle Ages. Um, you can see here another example from a herbal manuscript. This is the 13th century herbal here on the left hand side from the Egerton herbal which is in the British Library, uh, 13th century, and you'll see other examples of what are called Kentauria, you can't read it here, but Kentauria Major and Kentauria Minor, uh, small and large Kentauria. So it was quite well known in herbals, quite commonly depicted. Um, the origin of the name actually is from the word centaur or kentaur um, in Greek. Particularly the, the kentaur or centaur's name was uh, Chiron or Chiron in Greek. He was supposed to be a herbalist in ancient uh, mythology and you can see here at the bottom right hand side you've got uh, Diana presenting the centaur uh, Chiron or Chiron uh, with a plant. Uh, and this is in the um, 16th century Harley manuscript, again in the British Library. So you'll see that the actual centaur was famous and in, in, was well known in the, the mythology and well known also in the uh, medical side of the plant because he himself was a, supposedly a medical uh, practitioner. So remember the name because we'll come back to that in a minute. You've got um, Chiron or Chiron and Chiron with that H uh, beginning the letter. And we're thinking about the plant Kentauria, of course. Now. Here is an example from an Arabic manuscript. This is a wonderful uh, manuscript in Leiden, in Holland, in uh, the Netherlands. And the manuscript was in fact written in uh, Samarkand, in Central Asia, in 1082. And we know that precisely because of a, a little inscription that was written in the beginning of the manuscript. And here too, they recognize the Kentauria plant, but they call it, obviously in Arabic, they call it Kanturiun. This is a n here, nun which obviously comes straight from the, the Greek Kentauria. But obviously uh, the name in Arabic lasted for centuries just as it did in Greek. And in fact in modern English we still say um, Kentauri and in modern, for example in modern Turkish they talk about Kantaron and the same in uh, Azeri, uh, the language of Azerbaijan, other Turkic languages. So we'll see it still exists, this uh, idea of uh, the cent Centauri, so the name of Shiron or Chiron lives on. 
Back to the Voynich manuscript. Here on the right hand side you see a really nice example. This is taken from a 15th century Italian manuscript. But look at the way that Kentaura Maior is written. Notice these e, e, what it looks like e, e, but actually this is meant to be an N. This is meant to be a U. But notice how difficult it is to read it with simply the single use of the individual letters. And here's M, just written as three strokes and another stroke for I. Now to the practiced I in the Middle Ages and even to us today we can work out what this means but actually look at how it's written just with these little strokes. Now I'll suggest that in a few minutes time that this actually is used also in the Voynich manuscript, this style of writing these complex letters. So here we have the page uh, folio 2R with Kentauria here and you've got the first word uh, on the left and the first word of the second paragraph there and the left at the bottom. This is the first word of the first paragraph enlarged, and I want to suggest that this actually says kentairun, kentairun meaning kentauria. We've already seen the ka, look at the diagram below, we've seen the ka already from coriander, we've seen the ta already from taurus, taurus and also from coriander, we've seen the a from arar, um, no sorry that was not from arar, we've seen the a there from taurus, um, and we've seen, um, well we saw the N before, but this is where the N comes into its own. Now my uh, suggestion here is that these two letters form uh, the sound IR, with this being a R, uh, a R sound, and these must form a N and a N by deduction, because then you've got KANTAIRAN, KANTAIRAN, Again, assuming a lot from context, but also taking a number of letters uh, from what we know already from previous examples. Now this is a perfect fit, of course, because you've got Kentauria, the name of this plant. This is the very first word on the page. So it seems to me quite convincing to suggest that this actually is the word Kentor, Kentauria in various, in a, in, in a varied form. Now if we look at the second paragraph, this at first is a bit uh, deceptive because you think to yourself, well, this word here in the second paragraph is not the same as this one. Here has an extra letter and here it doesn't have. Does, does this mean that this is not really the plant Kentauria at all? Then it struck me that actually this could be the name of the Kentor uh, Chiron or Chiron himself. So if you take away the N there, which is the name of the end of ends the name of the plant, Kentaron, Kentairon, and here you have Kentair, you have basically the word centaur. And then here, the second word, um, I'll read it for the moment as chaur, and I'll just um, express this a little bit more clearly. Here, if we take that across there and bring this one up, you've got here on the left-hand side, kantairun, and here you've got ch, which is like a ch sound or a, a, a kaha, aspirated ka or a ha, or possibly a cha, and then you've got the a uh, that we've seen already, and then I suggest this is interpreted as um, or, just as we interpreted this as ir with one stroke, this one as or with two strokes, along the lines of the medieval practice in Latin script. So if this is true, we then have the first word as the word kentauria, and the second uh, paragraph begins with this the centaur uh, Shion or Cheon or Cheir, sorry, um, according to my reading here. But again, uh, this is subject to amendment, but it starts to build up a pattern of what is probably um, likely in the manuscript. So going back to the manuscript as a whole, the first paragraph would seem then to be about the plant, the second paragraph would seem then to be about the centaur Cheon uh, himself. Uh, and that's explaining the plant, what's called the etiology of the medicine or of the drug that we are using. So you'll see that we're starting to build up a gradual pattern. Now there's a slight um, problem here, and that is that we now seem to have three different signs for R. We've got this one here, which I suggested was in uh, Arar. We've got this one here, which is the, the one at the end of the word I thought, I thought was Arar, at the end of the line. And we've got this one here, which I've suggested for uh, the word centaur and the name Chiron as well. Now that could be problematic, but in fact this is not entirely impossible because it's quite likely, as it seems to me, looking at the shape of this one, 
that this one here is simply the same shape but with an ending downwards to signify, for example, the end of a line or the end of a sentence or the end of a paragraph. So it seems to me that these two could be exactly the same sound, but this one simply in a different position. Um, this one here is a bit curious because it's rather different from this, but it, it could be, for example, that it has a different inherent vowel in it. And this happens for, in some languages, for example, in um, Harik, that the script has a different vowel um, and a different letter shape for that uh, consonant plus vowel combination. So it could be, for example, this is ra, this is ur or ra, uh, we don't know as yet. Or it could be that they actually indicate slightly different versions of the ra. One could be, for example, a r, slightly longer one. This could be what's called allophonic. But again, we don't know. We have to do a bit more research into that. But nonetheless, I'm convinced that both of them, uh, both of number one and number three, do indicate the sound ra in various forms. Okay, turning now to the next plant, which is uh, on folio 3v of the manuscript, um, I want to suggest that this actually represents the hellebore plant, or from the genus Helleborus. Uh, and this is really in line with um, people like Sherwood, who've identified it as a form of uh, hellebore, perhaps Helleborus fetidus. Um, you've got the interesting uh, leaves, which um, apparently is supposed to resemble bear's feet. Um, and again, you can see more discussion of this in the um, full article on the website. Um, so I'm taking it that this is a form of uh, the hellebore. And then if we look at the first word of the page, you'll see it's highlighted here. Um, and this time, what I did was I wanted to test out my system so far. So I took the word and I tried to analyze it according to what we've seen uh, in previous plants. So taking the first letter, um, that was like a ka, which we saw from coriander and also from kentauria. So reading that as a ka. The second one as an a. Uh, um, again, that's from uh, taurus and various other uh, plants that we've seen. Then a, uh, we saw that in arar, uh, the third letter. Uh, and then uh, finally we have this strange um, combination of, of letters, which uh, we read before in uh, kentauria as IR with the single uh, stroke. Here we have two strokes, of course, so we could probably read this as um, UR or something similar, and that's what I've put in my analysis there um, at the bottom. So basically, let's read this as uh, Kawar and let's test out the theory. Now, the way that I tested this was I went to uh, Google and I, I typed in Kawar, K A U R, and then the word Hellebore just to see whether my reading could possibly be correct. And I was very pleased to see uh, that some, a lot of um, examples came up. And you'll see here, this is one of the examples that came up from uh, Google. Uh, you'll see that it's from a book by Panda about uh, Indian herbs. Um, and you can see here highlighted one of the pages from Panda's book which came up on the Google search. So we've got uh, the name Helleborus uh, Niger, the black hellebore there. Uh, we've got some of the names for it. You've got black hellebore in English. And then underneath you've got some Arabic forms which are written uh, by Panda in a slightly strange way, but he puts them as Khartu Kurbek, and then the Persian form as Kharabek Hindi. Uh, but most interestingly of all, underneath he puts the Kashmiri form as Kawar Ka'a. Uh, in other words, we seem to have an identical match of the name of the plant Hellebore with my reading of the plant according to my analysis so far. So you can imagine that I jumped out of my seat and was very pleased with this because it seems to ratify and uh, substantiate a lot of the analysis that I've put in so far. And you can try it yourself in Google if you like. Now, in the full article, I've written a, a full account of this word because it took me some 10 months of part-time study in, in libraries to look at the origin of this word coward, which looks like it might be Indian, but actually I discovered it has its roots in uh, Sumerian, um, then Akkadian, and goes into Semitic languages such as Arabic. Um, and particularly the Arabic word um, kharbaq, which uh, Panda's written in a rather strange way there as Kuwarbek, but actually if you look at Arabic manuscripts such as this 15th century manuscript in Princeton, uh, you'll see here an example of the plant and you'll see written there, if you can read Arabic on the right hand side in red, bottom right, it says Kharbaq Aswad, which is black, hellebore. So my point is that the, the word uh, Kawar uh, originates possibly from the uh, Sumerian Kurkur and then went into Semitic languages eventually as 
Kharbak. Bak comes from the um, Persian uh, Bech, which uh, means root. So you've got root of the Khar plant or root of the Kawa plant. So my contention is that this word Kawa is actually um, originally from the Sumerian but then was taken in and is a perfectly legitimate uh, reading for the uh, Voynich manuscript um, text. So let's look back at that again. So you've got the hellebore and you've got the first word again which is significant and I think it's quite convincingly read as kaor, uh, something like that of course we're not sure of the voweling uh, at this stage but it seems fairly plausible that this is a ka, there's a ra at the end and there's some sort of voweling with a, some sort of diphthong there uh, in the middle. So this uh, alerted me to the fact that my reading so far is possibly uh, substantiated. Okay, let's move on to the uh, sixth example. And here we have the plant which I, I consider to be a uh, Nigella sativa. Um, and this has been identified as Nigella sativa by quite a few people, as Sherwood again in her website. And I think this is unusual in the Voynich manuscript for being a pretty clear identification because you've got the, uh, the flower of the plant here very explicitly, very similar to the Nigella plant. And this is taken. Um, from uh, the web, the internet, and you've got um, the seed pods here very, very distinctive, and again, they seem to be very clearly represented. So it does seem to me that this is a um, fairly clear example of Nigella sativa, which was called black cumin or Roman coriander, and was famous for the black seeds, um, which it produced, and still, of course, we use it today in cooking. So this is folio 29V in the Voynich manuscript. Now again, if we then look at the first words of it, of the page, uh, there on the left hand side, um, and you'll see here we've got them again indicated and here enlarged. And the way that I would read this is, the first word actually is identical to the word for hellebore on the previous um, example we gave, uh, which would be a bit surprising. This is not a hellebore, but uh, if it's combined together with the second word, then it reads something like, in my analysis, you can see at the bottom there, uh, kaor, and you can see that on the bottom left, and then um, what I think is a reading here of cha, or probably more likely kha. Uh, kha, as you remember, we saw that in the name of uh, shiron, the centaur before, khiron, khairon, and here we have kaor, char or khar, uh, and this is interesting because this word char or khar is a very common form of the word meaning black uh, across many, many um, Asian and indeed some European languages as well. So this is uh, very tempting because nigella sativa is famous, of course, for the blackness of the seeds. In fact, the word nigella comes from the Latin niger, meaning black. Um, so, and also possibly the first word actually, kaur, could also be related etymologically to the word uh, black. So um, it's not entirely clear what, what the meaning of these two words is exactly. It could either be black kawar plant, in other words, the plant first and the adjective second, or it could actually mean black etymologically, and then black again with a different form. But the interesting thing is that you can see the emergence of this form into various different languages, particularly in the Indian subcontinent. You've got the, the Hindi term for nijala sativa is kalajira, the Tamil form, Karam Chirakam, uh, the Sanskrit form there, Krishna Jira. Um, this particular analysis here uh, looks at the Persian idea of Zire, which is seed. So it could be that in these, Tamil is most likely to be derived from black seed, black seed, and so on. Um, and if so, then uh, this uh, in the Voynich manuscript could be the word for seed. Um, it could, however, simply be another word for black and it's borrowed in a, in a way in a particular language uh, which takes account of these but is not necessarily identical to them. You also see that the, the Nigella sativa was very often um, confused with the uh, uh, caraway, the caraway seed as well, and other seeds as well actually. And it could be that this word in the Voynich manuscript is related to uh, the Latin. You've got carum carvi, uh, there in the bottom diagram. Uh, related to the Arabic karawaya or the Sanskrit karavi. Uh, so again, we're not really sure uh, which meaning is uh, correct for the Voynich manuscript, but my point is that either reading bears out the link with the symbols that I'm trying to establish. So no matter what we, whether we read it as black kawar or black black or black seed, nonetheless the, the key thing of the link between the sound and the sign seems to be clearly established. And I think we can um, accept it as quite probably 
valid by my analysis in any case. Okay, uh, let's now start to summarise. Um, I've put here on this uh, slide a summary of what I think are the um, sound sign correspondences in the Voynich script. Um, and you can see again the full list in the appendix of the uh, document on the website. But you've got there, if you look at the table on the left, you've got there the K, you've got there the N, and reading here, this is my reading of it, this is the EVA transcription of it, which is just to help people understand and, and analyse the manuscript. This is not the phonetic transcription. So this one here is what I consider it to be K, N, as we saw from Kentauria, Ta, which has been established with several different plants, and also Taurus, the constellation. Ra, which has also been established from Arar, Taurus, and so on. Tauron, and so on. Uh, you've got then the other form of Ra, which I think was established from Kentauria and also from Kawar. And then you've got this, the, the last sign, which is still tentative, but is probably some form of, of Ha. Um, probably not a cha, but I've put that there as a possibility. Uh, and that's from the reading of uh, Shiron or Chiron or Chiron, uh, and also from the reading of uh, Char in the case of Nigella Sativa. And then we move down to the vowels at the bottom. Uh, vowels are far more tenuous and uncertain, so this is very speculative here, but it looks like the O, what looks like the O, should be read as an A. Uh, this one could possibly be read as an A or a wa sound, an O sound, depending on the context. This one here, I'm reading it as an ir. This one as possibly an ur. Uh, this, these ones, of course, derived, I think, or copied from uh, Arabic manuscript forms of writing those particular vowels. But this one, the, the ra sound is, is not. It's obviously um, independent. This one I'm reading as possibly not the or This is the eva transcription, but as an o sound because of its uh, place in the coriander. Uh, and the long one, then, as u. But again, this, is, this still needs further corroboration. So having done this, of course, the next test is to try and move on to other pages in the manuscript to see if we can actually read them um, from what I've done so far. Now, this is not easy because we still haven't read many, many of the signs and we still have to work out carefully and systematically what those signs actually mean. Uh, that's important. But nonetheless, some of them do seem to be a little bit um, readable, if you like. So if you look here at this uh, word on the right, this is the first page of one of the um, plant manuscript pl uh, plant pages, and you'll see here we have, if you read it, you read it according to the signs we've read already. We've got ka is the first one. Uh, we've then got u. We've then got ta. We've then got a. We've then got na. So it reads tempting to read it as kuton. Now, could this possibly, and I'll leave the question mark there, could this possibly be um, cotton? Well, if you look at the plant itself, unfortunately, there's no sign particularly of cotton uh, in there, which is disappointing. It would be lovely if there was a little cotton uh, bud appearing. Uh, so we can't say for certain whether this does actually mean cotton, but nonetheless, it's still a possibility. And my proposal is that we continue to try and read the pages uh, using the letters that we have and then work hard to try and get the remaining letters which we don't have so far. So, moving towards the conclusion, what does this tell us about the Voynich manuscript as a whole? Well, first of all, and uh, this is my opinion from my evidence here, the Voynich manuscript is not a hoax, it's a genuine, meaningful document. Um, for the first time in 600 years, as it seems to me, uh, we can read some of the words and signs, 10 words and 14 signs and clusters are discussed in the article, one or two more than I've discussed here in this video. Um, let me just emphasize that although the reading here in this video makes it sound quite straightforward and simple, this of course is the, the result of lots of decades of work actually by many, many people. Um, credit should go to them and also by hard analysis and library work. It's not simply a question of putting things into Google and up comes the answer, unfortunately. It requires a lot of hard work in the library. Uh, enjoyable work though. Um, the evidence suggests that it's probably a 15th century treatise on nature, as it appears to be actually. It uh, probably is actually describing and analysing plants and their um, uses for human beings, as well as possibly medical and then astrological elements later in the, in the document. So I don't think, for example, it's a secret code uh, disguising some political purpose. I think it really is a 15th century treatise on nature. Um, and finally, the last point on this slide, it's not a secret code, I don't think, but I think it's simply an unknown script 
uh, in a language that's unknown but could possibly still be in existence if we can find out what it is. So let's look a little bit more at the script and other aspects of the manuscript. Well, it seems that there is some omission of vowels which resembles the, the abjad form of script such as Arabic. Arabic, for example, does not use vowels normally except for long vowels or in the case of the need for clarification. And it seems that the Voynich script also has some elements of abjad in it. But as we've seen, it does also indicate some vowels. So that's an interesting feature about the script. In terms of the language, which of course is a different matter from the script, uh, if you look at words like kawur, um, you see there seem to be influences from uh, the Near East, from the Middle East, from India, but not, I mean, you, although you have Kentauri and you have certain Greek elements as well and Latin elements in the script itself, uh, the word kawur for me indicates that the language is possibly actually not a European language, but that remains to be seen. But the, the manuscript still has lots of mixed elements of culture. Um, there are European elements, for example, you've got references to uh, Chiron, the centaur. Um, you've got lots of illustrations which seem to be European. Uh, but also you have Near Eastern things, such as uh, the names of the plants. You also possibly have uh, Caucasian elements as well. Um, for example, Georgian, the language of Georgia, um, includes a lot of the words which I've uh, mentioned here, including, for example, Kharbak um, for hellebore, uh, Arari for the seeds of the um, juniper plant, and so on. So there are, it's not yet clear which uh, country it comes from, but it could be um, any of these, and, and we'll obviously have to work to, to finding it. So let's think about where the manuscript was possibly written and how it came down to us. And let's think of this by using two interesting examples um, and what I consider uh, to be a likely uh, aspect of the Voynich manuscript, which is what I call the cultural extinction theory. So if you look at this example, this is the Glagolitic Slavic alphabet, and you can see a really nice account of this on Wikipedia. And this was an alphabet which was actually invented uh, by a small group of people for probably for a religious purpose actually but they uh, probably two brothers they invented this script themselves for a particular purpose developed it wrote it down and in fact it took off and was used to write a lot of manuscripts over many centuries but the interesting thing is that the Voynich manuscript could well have a similar provenance and purpose I'm not saying it's related to Slavic at all I don't think it is but I'm talking here about how such a manuscript could have been developed so here, for example, uh, we see that the Glagolitic Slavic alphabet was invented by a small group of people, possibly two brothers in the 9th century. Why was it invented? It was invented for a dialect which had no writing system up to that point, and that's important, I think. It's probable, I think, that the Voynich manuscript also was invented for a language or dialect which had no writing system up to that point. What's curious is that it didn't just borrow from another writing system, as it could have done. Instead, in this case, in the Slavic alphabet, it took signs from a variety of sources, possibly Greek, Hebrew, Coptic, Armenian, Samaritan, and so on. And curiously enough, the most famous document, the Kiev Missal, was probably written in Bohemia in the 10th century, but was only then found, refound again, in the 19th century in Jerusalem. So that shows you how a manuscript, an important manuscript, can travel a long, long distance and be found somewhere very far away from its origins. And for me, this is a really interesting example of how a manuscript, how a script can be developed by some a small group for a particular purpose and then carried a long distance away in a manuscript. Now, if you imagine that the Voynich manuscript could have followed a similar path, but yet the culture um, that was uh, that then developed the manuscript died out in some way and is now, if you like, culturally extinct, and that would be a straightforward um, suggestion for explaining the Voynich manuscript without needing to think about ancient Aztecs or space travel. Let's look at another example, the really interesting example of the Rongo Rongo script uh, found on Easter Island. And again, you can look at uh, Wikipedia um, for examples of that explanation of that. That's another case of a, a script that was obviously developed, possibly independently, on Easter Island, it was used for various purposes, nobody's quite sure what then the cultural extinction occurred, in which case the people who had written it and recorded it and used it died out without passing their secrets on to anybody else. So we don't know. This is an undeciphered, unexplained script. And again, it seems to me quite likely that the Voynich manuscript is an example of that. Unusual, of course, in being a single example. And we don't have any other examples of the script anywhere else. 
uh, but nonetheless I think perfectly possible and feasible. And that's my favoured um, explanation of the Voynich manuscript so far. But of course what we need to do is translate it and then we'll find out uh, clearly what it's all about. Well, who then wrote it? Let's try and summarise. In my view, it's written by a group of people, not an individual, and this is based on handwriting analysis that was carried out in the 1970s. Um, the script, I think, is completely invented, maybe borrowed from other elements, Greek, Latin, and so on. I suspect it's from previously unwritten language. Uh, that's my own view. But then, in my view, the group was somehow extinguished, and uh, I subscribe to the cultural extinction theory of the manuscript's origins. But again, as I say, what we need to do now is, I hope, build on what I've done so far in terms of decoding the script, decode it fully, and then try and identify the language in which it was written. So, just to summarise, uh, I hope I've contributed something to the decoding element. Let me emphasise once again that my decoding is tentative, it's provisional, it needs other people to work on it, to collaborate and so on, and you're very welcome to contribute comments to my website uh, if you want to, stephenbax.net. Um, I've identified, as I see it, roughly 10 words and 14 signs and clusters, depending on how you count uh, the signs and clusters, of course. But I hope I've also contributed in terms of methodology. Um, I believe it's a, a useful method to focus on proper names, just as Champollion did and Ventris did in decoding their particular languages and scripts. And I think that way we can possibly build up a complete sound sign system, that's what I'm moving towards next, and then finally move to a full decipherment. If we're lucky, we'll be able to identify the language, and that will help us considerably. If not, we'll try to reconstruct the language from the evidence that we have and try to understand what's going on in that, in that way. Uh, finally, I'd just like to say many thanks to the many Voynich scholars who've participated, particularly to René Zandberg and for his excellent scholarship and website and for setting up the Voynich 100 conference um, in 2012, which was such an interesting and, and stimulating event. Also, the Beinecke Library at Yale, uh, other copyright holders of images and so on, and to those who've helped and critiqued my work, and I've named some of them there at the bottom. And finally, thank you very much for listening. Feel free to look at the website, add your comments and suggestions, which will be very uh, welcome and very well received. Thank you very much.